I'm going to call the city council uh, work session to order with roll call. Mayor Van Gordon. Here. Councilors Pitts. Mo. Here. Rodley. Here. Stair. Here. Woodrow. Here. And Pishnery. I'm here. Thank you. All right. We have one item tonight, which is the police update with Chief Shear. Um, so I will turn it over to the chief. I know we've got quite a bit of content. So chief, could you give us, do you want us to hold our questions or just pop in when we have them? Um, I think to be most efficient with our time, if my preference is you hold them to the end, um, I've probably got about 45 minutes ish of presentation to do, and I will strive to keep it in that so that we've got plenty of time at the back end of the work session to answer questions if that works for you all. That would be perfect. All right, let's go then. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good evening, and thanks for the opportunity to present tonight. Um, before we begin the presentation, I want to state for the record how impressed I've been with the sworn staff and the professional staff that work here at SPD. Um, I've had the opportunity over the last almost five months to work side by side with them and to see firsthand how proud they are to work in Springfield and for the people of this community. Um, it's an agency made up of individuals that are some of the most committed and hardworking law enforcement professionals that I've had the honor of serving over my entire police career. <clears throat> In the face of challenges related to low staffing levels, this rapid evolution of the policing profession to meet community expectations, and through a deadly global pandemic, they come into work every single day, focused on the goal of delivering the service of public safety to you all. They serve the Springfield community with humility, and they serve with honor, and they, and they do it very well. We conducted a recent internal climate survey, and over 90% of the respondents here agreed with the following statement. I am proud to work at SPD. So like departments across the country, and right here in Oregon, SPD is striving to use harder lessons to improve. And just like each of you, we're all human, and therefore we're not perfect. But what we are is fully committed to the continual evaluation and growth in how we police in order to improve trust and meet this community's expectations. <clears throat> um, yeah, we'll, we'll hold all the comments until the end. So Tiff, we can go to the next slide. During uh, President Obama's presidency, he commissioned a task force on 21st century policing. And that task force presented us all with what are now commonly referred to as the six pillars of 21st century policing. Uh, the report continues to serve as the blueprint that police agencies use to build strong organization, organizational foundations across the country. And those six pillars are building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, technology and social media, community policing and crime reduction, training and education, and finally officer wellness and safety. SPD is committed to building these strong pillars here in Springfield and the growth that we are experiencing as an agency and the focused work we are doing is in direct alignment with each of these recommendations. <clears throat> so the four topics tonight are going to be hiring and staff, a hiring and staffing update, an update on the policy and training changes uh, directly resulting from a settlement agreement between the city and the Kenny family after the shooting death of Stacy Kenny by SPD. We're going to do an overview of our new software program called iPro. And we're also going to do a, a, a body worn camera program update. <clears throat> SPD currently has 122 authorized positions. So you can see here that the largest number of vacancies are in the sworn police officer ranks. We staff our patrol functions in order to have a minimum of six officers on patrol at any given time around the clock. And our patrol officers work a 12 hour shift. The current reduced staffing levels require us to utilize detectives and our traffic motorcycle officers to fill patrol shifts in order to meet the demand and maintain an adequate number of officers able to respond to our calls for service. And the trade off we get by doing that is then less time devoted to some investigations and specialized traffic focused missions. Another challenge is that in order to meet our minimum daily staffing requirements, we have to utilize overtime to fill gaps created by those absences. And so at times we're forced to mandate overtime at the end of an officer's shift in order to fill those gaps. And while doing so helps us deliver 
the type of service the people of Springfield expect. It is expensive, and more importantly, it, create, it creates fatigue for our officers. Coming into work on your day off or longer than 12 hours at a time can negatively impact officer wellness and then in turn our performance. From the day that I arrived here, one of the top priorities and concerns I heard from within SPD was for us to improve our staffing. Uh, I think we all know that uh, the days of people lining up to take advantage of open job opportunities are gone. And due to a variety of factors that include COVID related workforce challenges and the idea that we are undergoing what is being now referred to as the great resignation, uh, public perception concerns with law enforcement in recent years, and the demanding nature of the job, it is more difficult than ever before to recruit, hire, and retain qualified and exemplary candidates. So what are we doing about it? <clears throat> in the last three months, we've ramped up our efforts to focus on filling vacancies. We've enhanced our marketing for open positions. We've leveraged the reach of social media by advertising nationally on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And these efforts have resulted in tens of thousands of views of the content and resulted in interested applicants from across the country. Uh, we've created new infographics to share rather than just the generic uh, job postings that used to get posted. And we consciously strive to portray an image showing that we value and we are seeking a diverse workforce and that we promote an inclusive work environment. Uh, we recently hired a dedicated public information coordinator and that new position plays a key role in our recruiting efforts and is focused on bolstering our online presence in new and creative ways in order to attract candidates. And in addition to generally engaging in just a higher volume of social media postings to improve transparency, we've begun producing short videos that display what we stand for as a PD, the people who make up SPD, and the benefits of working in this city. Earlier this month, we filled a long vacant community outreach coordinator position, and we're fortunate to have a person who is solely dedicated to building relationships all throughout Springfield. And as they begin their work, specifically in diverse and sometimes underserved communities, it's not only going to help us build trust, but it's also going to widen our reach in terms of future recruiting efforts. Uh, we've engaged in a very aggressive program to recruit and hire lateral officers. Um, for those of you who don't know, a lateral officer is one who has already attended the police academy and is a trained and certified officer working at a different law enforcement agency. And the benefit of hiring a lateral is that we do not have to put them through the entire new officer training program or send them to the basic police academy. And what that does, it allows us to put them into service much quicker, thereby providing relief to our overworked officers and reducing the need for as much overtime spent. <clears throat> by offering hiring bonuses, vacation and sick time hours on the books when they get hired, reimbursement for some moving expenses, we've been able to attract several lateral officer candidates. Uh, two of the five people you see here we just hired last month were lateral candidates, and we have several more who've applied and are in various stages of our hiring process. I'm seeking out only the best lateral candidates. Those that are committed to the people of Springfield and those who can demonstrate that they can treat everybody with dignity and respect. And we've heard of what are sometimes called transient officers that move from agency to agency to stay ahead of accountability for poor performance. Um, I wanna put everybody's mind at ease that they can rest assured that I am not gonna hire anyone into this organization or this city who falls into that category. We streamlined our hiring process. Uh, we conduct the first three phases of testing during a weekend to make it as convenient as possible for the candidates. We conduct a written test, we score them on site that day, then we move those to pass that directly on to the Oregon Physical Abilities Test, which is a standardized test developed by the State Department of Public Safety Standards and Training. Those who pass that, then they move on to their first panel interview. And we have begun trying to include people from outside the PD to sit on our interview panels. Now it's been a challenge, Due to the time commitment it takes and the short notice recently due to our ramped up efforts and the overwhelming need to run these processes hasn't allowed us to do it on every interview, but it is a goal I have set for our professional standards division to engage in as we move forward. Those who successfully make it through those three phases then are scheduled for the chief's interview the following week. And then they may be moved directly onto the background process, sometimes the same day as the chief's interview. 
we can now conduct video chiefs interviews for those that may live elsewhere and they might not have the means or the free time to travel back to Springfield a second time. And I know other city jobs have had the ability to do this for some time, but many of the phases necessary to hire police officers require that the applicants be physically present. I just conducted a video chiefs interview about two weeks ago for a person that was actually in Italy. Um, and by compressing our process timeline and by being willing to adapt to an individual applicant circumstances is one way that we can create a more equitable process for all candidates. And because when somebody might struggle financially to take multiple days off of work or pay the expense of multiple trips to Springfield, we can lose out on good quality candidates. We started utilizing contract background investigators from outside the department, which, and what that does, it increases our internal capacity to focus on other important areas rather than assigning our officers and investigators to conduct the background. It allows the investigator to focus only on the investigation rather than them juggling all the other duties that they would if they were assigned to our internal officers and detectives here at the PD. Timeliness, consistency, and in some cases, the thoroughness are improved greatly when compared to when we assign them out internally. Uh, the psychological examination is conducted online. But what we've done is our professional standards sergeant has been granted the authority by the doctor to proctor the computer portion of that exam right here in Springfield. So that saves time because we don't have to schedule appointments way in advance and have the candidates drive up to the doctor's location in the Portland metro area. A lot of agencies won't hire candidates until they can send them directly to the police academy. But the problem is today with COVID, those, those police academy slots might be months away. The next academy that we have available to us right now doesn't even start until February. So if we don't hire people until they get them into the academy, during that time frame, good candidates are going to seek employment elsewhere rather than wait around. And we've taken the approach that we're going to hire them as quickly as we can, whether they can get into the academy or not. We can begin training internally, which I also feel better sets them up for success when they do finally attend the academy. <clears throat> Scarcity of candidates. And uh, the extreme competition among law enforcement agencies for the most desirable candidates, it requires us to move very quickly or as quickly as possible in our hiring process without compromising the standards in order for us to achieve success. Uh, I can say it's been a team effort within the PD and with city HR these last few months, and I, I can say our efforts are paying off. <clears throat> as we move forward, Beyond the COVID-19 restrictions, we're going to prioritize attending in-person events and job fairs specific to recruiting diverse pools of candidates. So what this slide shows that we have some ground to cover in the recruitment of female officers. We are ahead of the national average for police departments, which is roughly 12%. <clears throat> this slide shows the demographics of the department in comparison to the demographics of the city. And the biggest area of improvement that I think we identify from this graphic is the need for us to work towards building better relationships with our Hispanic community members. Um, over time, this is going to build trust and increase the number of Hispanic applicants and police hires. Uh, building relationships within students in high schools and colleges is another way we can develop candidates for the future. And I can tell you the relationships that our school resource officers build today are going to pave that pathway into this career for tomorrow's public servants. Another thing we can do that's more farther term looking is develop a cadet program in the future that would be another way to develop future Springfield officer candidates. <clears throat> On March 31st, 2019, SPD members conducted a traffic stop of the vehicle driven by Stacy Kenny. And that encounter ultimately ended when Stacy Kenny was shot and killed by an SPD sergeant after a series of events that led to her driving away with the sergeant in the passenger seat of that car. In September of 2020, the city reached a settlement with the estate of Stacy Kenny. And as a part of that agreement, Michael Janako of the OIR group conducted an assessment of SPD that resulted in 33 recommendations for changes to policy, practices, and protocols. And the majority of those recommendations were for SPD, while some of them were specific to the work of IDFIT, 
which is the interagency deadly force investigation team. It's a team that's led by our district attorney. Many of these recommendations are, are recognized as best practices, and we've taken substantial steps here at SPD towards implementation and completion. So I intend to go through each of these recommendations and share we, where we are with the implementation and or the existing challenges to implementation. <clears throat> the SPD use of force policy was modified as a result of this agreement. And over the last four months, we've made additional changes to further and further clarify the language uh, within our force policy. So rather than put all of these recommendations on slides, we've attached them to this um, document that you've got on the screen ahead of you. And we're going to be what I'm basically going to be doing is I'm not going to go through and read the recommendation verbatim. I'm just going to be touching on what our response is just uh, in order to be as efficient as we can with our time. So recommendation number one related to the crime seed log. We absolutely agree with that recommendation. And we've since updated our use of force policy to include language giving very clear direction for all of our members regarding crime scene responsibilities, which includes maintenance of a crime scene log at the scene of an officer involved shooting incident. It's also, we've also included language very specific uh, related to the on-scene supervisors, establishing that they have the responsibility of securing the crime scene, establishing a single entry point in and out of that crime scene, and establishing who's permitted to enter and that a log, a crime scene log is kept. Uh, the second, re second recommendation, again, that's advocating that IDFIT um, improve its protocols related to the crime scene as well, and we absolutely agree with that. Recommendation three, we should advocate um, the IDFIT protocols modified to ensure a broad scope of fact collection, including the tactical decision-making and related force options preceding the use of force. So we agree with that. The, the IDFIT investigation is a criminal investigation, and the purpose of a criminal investigation is to determine if local, state, or federal criminal statutes were violated in relation to the use of that force. So the investigation at a minimum needs to con consist of the eyewitness interviews, the evidence collection, scene documentation, et cetera. <clears throat> the collection of facts to include tactical decision-making and related force options should always be included as part of the review during this investigation. Recommendation four. <clears throat> we agree with this and we've addressed um, this in an update to our general order, which the supervisor responsibility at the scene of an officer involved shooting is to locate and separate the witness and involved members to ensure that no communication regarding the incident takes place. <clears throat> recommendation five, uh, we should recommend that the, the IDFIT modifies protocol so the same shift interviews the officers occur. So we agree with this in part. So SPD is committed to working with IDFIT to provide details regarding the shooting so that IDFIT can move forward with their investigation. Uh, their current protocols suggest waiting 48 hours prior to interview the officer. <clears throat> a public safety statement should absolutely be obtained at the scene. And the, there are questions that are asked the involved officer as soon after the incident as possible to make sure there's no known threats at the scene. And as part of a policy update to our use of force policy, we have created a format to specifically ask these questions um, the day of the shooting. <clears throat> That's the sixth recommendation. I mean, th this is one that's a little more challenging. So the recommendation is that SPD should conduct administrative interviews of involved officers prior to the end of shift. So while it's critical for the detectives to conducting an officer involved shooting to learn about the officer's action, decision-making observations, uh, obtaining a same shift statement, I don't feel is essential to a, an effective officer involved shooting investigation. <clears throat> the recommended practice is to complete the criminal investigation first, followed by the administrative investigation. And while both the criminal and administrative investigations are important and should be aggressively pursued, investigative conflicts between the two formats should be resolved by allowing the criminal investigation to have priority. And then this, prior to, this prioritization um, can help eliminate the competition between these two formats for access to witnesses, physical evidence. And the goal of the investigation is to obtain all the facts and the interview of the involved officer will likely provide those facts and likely corroborate or refute evidence from that investigation. An investigator showing up to do an interview of an involved member has to be armed with as much evidence and information as possible in order to follow up on statements 
provided to confront the interviewee with evidence that may be contrary to the statement provided. Recommendation seven, SP needs to advocate that um, IDFIT adopt consistent witness officer protocols specifically related to recording these interviews. And we agree. Uh, we advocate that IDFIT should obtain witness officer statements in a location that affords the use of videotaping. Um, we also support audio recording of the interview, and we advocate for the interview to be transcribed and those recordings and transcriptions included in the investigative file. Recommendation eight. <clears throat> We agree with this recommendation and absolutely advocate for the training and protocol development to ensure consistency and systematic investigations because without transparency and a thorough investigation, I think the relationships we have with our community will suffer and the legitimacy as a police agency is absolutely called into question. Recommendation nine, advocate for developing it fits protocols to require video interviews uh, involved with officers. Again, we agree. Um, we are advocates of, and we support the idea of video recording and tape recording the interview that involved officer. Um, but it's important to note also that this criminal interview, this criminal investigation interview of the officer is voluntary on the part of the officer. And if the officer refuses to be party to that video recording, the investigators need to document that refusal, but they should proceed with the interview, even if they just get an audio recording. Recommendation 10, advocate that IDFIT revise their officer-involved protocols to ensure preparation of reports by everybody that responds to an officer-involved shooting. We agree. Um, through our response to recommendation 11 below, we'll talk about that here in a minute, but we absolutely agree that everybody shows up at the scene, if they're not interviewed by investigators, should write police reports related to their activities at that scene. Recommendation 11, again, we agree, like I just said, um, we've made changes to policy, um, our use of force policy to address the officer responsibilities and the expectation of SPD that officers that are not directly involved in the incident, but that responded to the scene, no matter how slight their involvement may have been, will be to document their involvement in a police report. And that police report will be um, then get to the infant investigator. Recommendation 12. <clears throat> Uh, when a taser is deployed, um, the investigation should request a full analysis from the manufacturer. We agree. Um, our current SPD policy states that the use of the taser resulting in a stun of a suspect is going to be documented in accordance with policy. And at the conclusion of the arrest, after the suspect is released or incarcerated, the taser will be given to the supervisor for a download. Um, we've included in that policy language that the responding supervisor will obtain it run it through the procedures, get it to the IDFIT supervisor as soon as possible for a manufacturer analysis. Recommendation 13. <clears throat> um, as a matter of course, in a critical incident review, we should conduct an administrative interview of witnesses involved in officers to gain insight regarding tactics, decision-making, and other issues. Agreed. And to bolster this language, um, we've added to our policy that provides for a force review committee and it says it shall be appointed to review deadly use of force with guidelines on how to operate. The committee is going to determine findings of fact as to the circumstances surrounding the use of force. They're going to consider the reasonableness of the officer's actions in accordance with the law and the guidelines of policy. And the primary goals of the committee are to thoroughly examine use of force incidents to identify areas of improvement in training, tactics, equipment, or policy changes that are going to better prepare our personnel for future use of uh, force events and identify any reasonable alternatives to the actions that could potentially eliminate or reduce the likelihood of, of a use of force. The committee is not going to examine only the actual use of force, but the events and tactics and decision making of each involved officer that led up to that utilization of force. And they're going to make appropriate recommendations as to policy or training modifications. Uh, recommendation 14. Eliminate the ability of the involved officer to select a department member for the use of force review board. So this um, provision was negotiated with the police union and the chief of police as part of the policy. I am absolutely committed to, to furthering this discussion in labor negotiations. And it, it but I want to, I want to note that the determination of whether or not a force is within policy is made by the chief of police. I am fully committed to making an informed decision with a focus on continuous improvement. And so while I understand the perception of the involved member um, being able to select one person on that committee, that is just one person on that committee. And ultimately, 
um, I make the final I make the final decision. Recommendation 15. Um, we should set out in writing the minimal expectations for the doc for the uh, use of use of force review board deliberation. We agree with this. Again, we've updated our policy that includes language that requires that committee to form a written response in a report with a fixed format consisting of structured sections that include an incident summary, timelines, identification of involved personnel, uh, debriefs of the involved officer, observations concerning pre-use of force decision-making, decision points, de-escalation, policy, supervision, training, equipment and personnel, and then ultimately findings, recommendations, and conclusions. Recommendation 16. Now, the use of force review board should be tasked with reviewing all the decision making uses of force from the inception of the incident and consider the performance of all the uh, involved officers. We agree. Um, I think we covered that in the previous recommendation, but, but we agree with that. <clears throat> recommendation 17. We're going to divide, the SPD should devise protocols to ensure that any recommendations or training issues identified by the force review board are implemented. Uh, by assigning the responsibility to someone and delegating an SPD command staff member to ensure effective and timely implementation. Uh, we agree. We've updated our policy to reflect that the chief of police is also responsible for implementation of the recommendations for change in that policy, supervision, training, equipment, et cetera. Um, the chief can delegate this responsibility at any time that if I were to delegate that responsibility, that would be to a specific person with a specific timeline to ensure that, that, that those recommendations were met. 18, we need to incorporate a debriefing phase into the use of force review board for the uh, involved officers. We agree. Again, we updated our policy to include language that states upon the conclusion of that force review board, the board is gonna present its findings to the involved employees prior to that board's presentation to the chief of police. That involved member is gonna be provided the opportunity to speak uh, to their employed tactics, the performance of their equipment, the need for any um, additional training, um, and to provide their insight and their perspective on the investigative and review process. <clears throat> Recommendation 19. SPD's force, use of force review board should consider whether the officer met agency expectations for accessing available background information about the subjects prior to this incident occurring. Uh, we agree. The review board is gonna consider whether that officer, officer met those expectations for accessing that background information um, and should identify and remedy any potential systemic um, impediments to access that type of information. <clears throat> Recommendation 20. <clears throat> the use of force review board will consider any dispatch issues as part of the officer involved shooting group. Again, we agree. Um, the use of force review board is going to take that into consideration and they will attend a regular meeting with Central Lane 911 to go over any concerns or systemic issues identified as part of that review. 21. Develop a policy requiring officers to deploy de escalation techniques prior to resorting for, to force when feasible. We agree. We've made changes to the use of force policy addressing de-escalation techniques using an objectively reasonable standard, and all officers are receiving annual training designed to reinforce our policy objective of minimizing the number of use of force incidents. 22, uh, SPD should develop policy requiring use of force review board to consider as part of the review whether the involved officers follow de-escalation training and policy. Again, we agree. We've added language to policy to ensure that the committee members address pre-use of force decision-making that includes the identification of key decision points for each involved officer and whether de-escalation was reasonably safe, prudent, and feasible, and if so, whether the de-escalation um, attempts were made. 23, <clears throat> when we evaluate a use of force incident, the board should consider and analyze the efficacy and appropriateness of all the uses of force. Again, we agree. That review committee is going to evaluate all the uses of force within that um, OIS incident, not only to learn what led up to the OIS, but to determine if the appropriate force, the escalation, and tactics were used prior to the officer involved shooting. And that's going to help us know um, what training we may need for the future and help understand what led to that OIS occurring. 24, uh, consider 
whether to eliminate the use of focused blows as a force option or restrict their use as follows. Prohibit blows to the head, um, require blows be delivered with a palm strike, and require that blows be restricted to no more than three. But I agree in part. So the reasonableness of a particular use of force has to be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene. And the calculus of that has to embody an allowance for the fact that that police officer um, and the police officers are often forced to make split second decisions about the amount of force necessary in a particular situation. So the responsibility of SPD in this incident in this incidents is to evaluate each use of force case and determine if a focused blow was the most appropriate use of force. We're gonna to continue to work with our defensive tactics trainers and experts to train officers on alternatives that can include palm strikes and we'll continually um, evaluate the number of strikes. Officers are trained to evaluate the results of their individual actions during the course of an incident and make changes based on the circumstances. So officers have to continually analyze what's happening on a split second basis with the goal to use the least amount of force reasonably necessary when they're acting in direct response to the actions of an arrestee. 25, <clears throat> uh, SPD has, should do an evaluation of the supervisor's performance in line with the expectations. And we agree um, that Force Review Committee is gonna um, do an analysis of the performance of the supervisors and it's gonna be evaluated in the same way as any other, any other member that was involved in the incident. 26, during the evaluation of our force, um, we should consider whether its use would effectively eliminate any threat presented as well as at its own potential to increase the threat to the public. Uh, we agree, we've updated our policy directing that force committee to determine findings of fact as to the circumstances surrounding the use of force to include the reasonableness of the officer's actions in accordance with the law and the guidelines of the policy. And that community, that committee examines use of force incidents to identify areas for improvement that we've already talked about um, related to future use of force events and, and to identify any reasonable alternatives that they could have taken. 27, we need to devise policy and training instructors not to reach into or enter civilian vehicles. We agree. In 2021, um, the SPD defensive tactics instructors conducted training on how to extract subjects from vehicles in a manner that reduces the risk of injury to the arrestee and the officer. And the training included hands-on techniques and a review of situations that were not successful to learn lessons from those cases. We need to devise policy and training um, addressing the advisability of trying to remove people through a vehicle window. And as stated above, our instructors just conducted training on how to extract subjects from vehicles in a manner that reduces the risk of injury to the arrestee and ensures a, um, a safe outcome. 29, whenever the use of the taser accompanies deadly force, SPD use of force review board needs to consider the propriety of its use and whether it met department expectations. We will continue to exceed those recommendations and best practices and continue to evaluate the usefulness of the taser how it was used in circumstances leading up to a deadly force event as is outlined in our policy. Uh, recommendation 30, we need to revise a taser policy to limit deployment to three cycles, prohibit activations longer than five seconds, and prohibit simultaneous taser activation by multiple officers. We agree. We're currently in the process of updating our taser policy and addressing the deployment of taser applications against the same individual and simultaneous taser activations by more than one officer. Uh, recommendation 31, actually back to that one. We've actually just received um, an updated battery for our tasers that it does not allow the taser to go beyond five seconds unless you intentionally reset the trigger and deploy it a second time. So once we roll those batteries out here in the next month or so with training to everybody, our tasers will not be physically capable of exceeding five seconds without an intentional reset and deployment of that trigger. Recommendation 31, uh, we, need, we should create a written directive assigning the task of analyzing use of force by officer identifying any outlier officers. We agree. Um, one of the next things we're gonna talk about is the purchase of our iPro software, which is gonna allow us now as we move into the future to track use of force much more efficiently and identify inordinate uh, uses of force by outlier officers. 
Recommendation 32, in the context of our officer involved shooting matters, we should refrain from sitting at the table at press conferences with the district attorney. We agree. Recent incidents with the DA has released a statement followed up by a separate statement from SPD, I think have been effective. And we're gonna be very deliberate um, how we address this moving forward and we very much understand the optics of this. In recommendation 33, in the immediate aftermath of an officer involved shooting, the chief should reach out to the surviving family members and officer condolences. I agree. Um, in collaboration with our city attorney's office, we will make a statement that expresses an appreciation for the sanctity of human life and indicating that SPD places its highest value on the preservation of human life while it understands the seriousness of an officer involved critical incident. And we also agree that a meeting with the family to express condolences and share a commitment to a thorough and unbiased investigation should be done as soon as it's appropriate. <clears throat> We've taken substantial steps towards implementation of these recommendations. And as a contributing member of the DA's IDFIT team, uh, we're committed to working collaboratively with the DA and IDFIT to further improve and enhance overall effectiveness. Um, I can say that we have a meeting set with representatives from the, the Kenny family in the weeks ahead to go over these recommendations to solicit their feedback in our ongoing effort to grow and improve as an organization. We've also just recently set a member of our control tactics team to attend a multi-day instructor course for de-escalation. And the focus is gonna be on including a philosophy and practice of de-escalation techniques in our yearly training curriculum. Um, that touches on the recommendations and our responses. So I look forward to answering uh, any questions or providing clarification on them as we, as we close in on the end of this work session. So I pro update. For about the last 17 years, um, SPD has handled community complaints and commendations on a one-page Word document you see here called a personal conduct report. And while this system might have been adequate for the department in years past, it is not capable of providing us with the level of detail and accurate data we need today for effective analysis. And that's analysis we need in order to inform us on where to approve, an analysis we can share with counsel and the public to improve transparency, increase accountability, and build trust. That old form didn't allow us to track status of the investigations. It didn't allow us to attach digital files. Um, and the previous pathway for investigating the community complaint was as follows. So an on-duty sergeant would take the complaint and then they would handle that administrative investigation up through discipline and or closure. Then it was routed to the Lieutenant, then to the Chief of Police, and then finally back to the Professional Standards Office where it was filed. Well, that Professional Standards Office might not even know there was an investigation going on until it finally landed in their office. And then they would file in the cabinet based on the type of complaint year. There was no searchable database to track and produce statistics in a timely fashion. And that lack of a central clearinghouse and a system for ensuring consistent, complete, and timely investigations, what it does is it results in real or perceived disparities in levels of discipline administered by our officers. It can create perceptions of favoritism and it erodes internal legitimacy among employees and damages the level of trust a community has in their PD. The existing system was not acceptable for where we need to be in terms of professional excellence today. So in mid-21, SPD put in place new leadership in our professional standards division. And I arrived here shortly after that, and that sergeant and I immediately began identifying shortcomings in the existing accountability process. The department needed an improved process for tracking and handling complaints, tracking types and levels of use of force, and we also just obtained body cameras. And there was an automated system in place to track, monitor, and produce a force report that the depth of content, clean data that we that we that would allow us to use for effective analysis towards improvement. The department had previously identified and purchased software called iPro, and that's a program that's used across the nation and by police departments in Oregon to include our neighbor Eugene PD. So in May, we signed a contract uh, for this year that included the implementation and training expenses. And what iPro does is it can track complaints, inquiries, and commendations electronically, and it'll improve our processes. So this diagram shows what the process is gonna look like moving forward. The on-duty sergeant takes a complaint. They're gonna forward it via IA Pro to the Office of Professional Standards. The Office of Professional Standards reviews it, gives it a number so it can be tracked to assure accountability and maintain timelines. Then that complaint's gonna be triaged and determined whether it will be handled by the professional standards division or assigned back to a supervisor for investigation. So once it's completed, 
It's routed up through the chain of command, requiring additional level review, levels of review and improved accountability. And it finally reaches that secure database maintained by professional standards where all related paperwork, audio recordings, body camera footage live with that investigation in electronic file. <clears throat> and in addition to replacing the, that old form for internal investigations related to complaints, IAPRO also allows for capturing data related to police and jail uses of force. <clears throat> Involved officers fill out this electronic module when they complete their arrest report. It then gets routed to the supervisor who was on shift at the time. Supervisor attaches other police reports, body camera footage, and any other data related to the case. And those supervisors then review that entire case incident, approve it, or if it's incomplete, they send it back to the officer for additional follow-up and clarification. Once it's approved by that sergeant, it's sent within IA Pro to the lieutenant. The lieutenant reviews it and approves the actions. Then it gets forward to professional standards where it's archived. This slide just provides a visual of what IA Pro captures and the advantages it provides us over the pre-2021 method. Like in addition to the major features we described, it also allows us to track data specific to vehicle pursuits, for example. And it's also going to be the system that supervisors maintain employee working files within for their performance evaluations. Uh, the following slides are from the Eugene Police Department. These are not our numbers, but these are numbers from the Eugene Police Department. Um, their yearly use of force report, and they're shared just as an example. We're going to be able to provide data on specific areas of interest. For example, if an analysis uh, on the number of types of use of force, let's say between April and November was requested, that report could gen be generated within minutes. Previously, our ability to do that would require someone manually reviewing written reports, to extrapolate out the information from reading narratives, which is a time consuming and more importantly, a potentially inaccurate process. We can retrieve, for example, uses of force with a taser only or any other type of force we set up in the system. And these graphics are just examples of the kind of granular detail that we will be able to review and share. And it's not just limited to force. Like I said, we can track data related to vehicle pursuits, like average speed, length of the pursuit, whether any collisions or injuries resulted, et cetera. Between June and August of this year, we did the remote installation and configuration training for all our system administrators. Beginning in September, we held on-site IA Pro uh, end user training for the police and jail supervisors, our field training officers, and a number of others. And in October, we're now conducting virtual training and follow-up in person um, for the police and jail officers who did not make that additional training. And we're currently on track to go live with this on November 1st, which is going to be the point where we begin capturing more extensive, consistent, and cleaner data for future analysis. And the data we intend to collect is going to allow us to produce accurate and actionable year-end reports with infographics and a variety of different customization options. With the accountability and the transparency needs of today, this software, this IAPRO software is essential for this police department and the city. Body more camera update. <clears throat> so the body more camera program um, has been an ongoing effort since 2019. And the week of May 24th this year, which happened to be my first week at SPD, we began training all the officers in the PD. And by the end of that week, we went live with officers deploying on a daily basis with body cameras. Uh, body cameras are a significant step forward towards establishing a culture of accountability and transparency. And I definitely want to thank council, everybody at SPD, and anybody else that put in work on this project over the past couple of years, getting it to the implementation phase. It's something that I think the people of Springfield should be very proud of to support. And I know the members of SPD are extremely grateful for this uh, technological advancement. Because there's interactions that body cameras can miss, we've also elected to utilize cameras on the front and the rear of our vehicle, as well as inside the back seat of our patrol cars, uh, as you can see by that picture on the lower left of your screen. The system approves accountability for the SPD members who wear the camera and accountability for the community members who are recorded during the interactions. The video can serve as evidence in criminal cases that produce improved outcomes in terms of case clearance rates. And videos provide another piece of evidence to review when allegations of misconduct are made against officers. The video also allows us to improve training by being able to learn from the shared experiences of other officers through the review of video for lessons learned. <clears throat> We've got 24 patrol cars that are outfitted with cameras and 64 body cameras. 
And that's enough for all the sworn officers and it provides us with extras to check out in case of malfunctions or, or for people that don't have them permanently assigned. They're required for all patrol operations and that includes traffic, canine and school resource officers. And we're also one of the few agencies that's requiring them to be worn by the SWAT officer during tactical incidents. So at the beginning of each shift, the officers take out a fully charged camera, they log into their car computer, um, that camera then syncs with the other cameras in that car and the recording system in the car. Uh, when they turn on their overhead lights, it automatically triggers the system to turn on and be begin recording. And when officers can also manually turn on the body camera, when they do that, that activates all the other cameras in the car as well. Um, they're required to turn on the camera during the following instances. All enforcement and investigative contacts, traffic stops, contacts that can become an adversarial that might not otherwise have required recordings or during the transport of people that are in custody. Our officers notify the parties that are recording of the conversations being made, but there are exceptions by, um, set by Oregon law for certain investigative circumstances. Um, witnesses and victims can request the, comp the camera be turned off as long as the encounter is non-confrontational. Um, some of the examples of when they don't have to record is if it jeopardizes safety planning for victims, um, it interferes with the ability to conduct sensitive investigations, or if there's locations that have a reasonable expectation of privacy, such as, you know, of course, restrooms or locker rooms or healthcare facilities. Um, if the camera is not turned on manually when it's required to be, that officer has to notify a sergeant and document the incident in a police report or in the computer. Um, the policy violation is then addressed in accordance with our collective bargaining agreement. During critical incidents, it's the sergeant's job to collect up those cameras from the involved members and secure them. And we talked about that with the recommendations earlier. Um, this is an interesting fact that the video is stored by GTEC, which is the camera company. And that original video is unable to be tampered with or modified. We do have the ability to produce a version of it that's redacted. Um, where we can remove faces or other images that may need to be protected. Um, what we're going to show you now is a short video that shows um, what the forward-facing camera and the body-worn camera captures. It also highlights our ability to redact the faces. And in this example, we redacted the um, license plates as well. Hello, I'm Officer Goals from the police department. Just so you know, I am recording. You know why I pulled you over? This is what I think happened, is that you had to yield to turn yeah. and the other cars were coming and then you kind of got stuck in the middle. Does that sound probably about right? Yeah. Okay. You know where you're headed now? All right, thanks, man. Just be careful, okay? We don't want you running red lights enough, all right? Okay. Have a good day. <clears throat> so that wraps up the body-worn camera update. Um, there were, there were the four topics I was asked to update, but I want to take just a few more minutes in closing to touch on so, some other items. So over the past few months and in the near term ahead, I can say we are, we're making deliberate changes to improve our effectiveness, to mitigate risk, and to build community trust. Um, and here's just a few examples of that. So with our regional partner agencies, we're working towards a more collaborative approach to our critical incident response capabilities. Um, our tactical unit is now working closely with the sheriff's office towards a more effective regional response to high threat incidents. We started training alongside deputies to ensure we're better prepared to jointly address these worst case scenarios when they occur. Uh, we're partnering with the Eugene PD in development of a, a unmanned aerial system capability, which is designed to de-escalate situations through improved communication, allowing for greater distance and time to protect our officers and the public from dangerous threats. We're transitioning our patrol fleet from being all black to a light silver color. And I know this change is small, but I, but I think it's symbolic of the effort that we're undertaking at SPD to improve perceptions of the police. The lighter color cars, and they, they provide a fresh new look. And I think they're in line with where other agencies such as our state police partners are headed as well. Um, we are in the early stages of an internal reorganization. Um, the first step in this is to include a new member to the department executive team. That's going to be a professional staff, non-sworn business services manager who's going to oversee our dispatch and records division. I also intend to assign an additional sergeant to the professional standards unit to assist with internal investigations. And then that person is also going to be responsible for focusing on development of a strategic and comprehensive training plan for the department. 
I'm going to be seeking to also recruit and hire an analyst specifically to manage and evolve IA Pro and its powerful ability to inform us on where our policy and training should be focused uh, to reduce complaints and uses of force. Um, <clears throat> we're changing the look of the front lobby of the Justice Center, and I'm doing that. We're doing that to make it, I think, a more warmer and welcoming to the guests and those come in for police assistance. So I am an ardent supporter of police canine programs. You're not going to find somebody that is a bigger supporter of police canine pro programs when they're run uh, professionally and very well, like the one here at SPD. But the, when you walk into the police department, the first thing you see on this wall is all these pic, black and white pictures of the canines. So we're going to be moving that to a different place in the building. And in their place is going to be, and this is just an artist rendering here, um, in their place is going to be a large, brightly colored backlit SPD patch on the wall. And so at night, it's going to be visible through all the large front windows of the, uh, the police station. And it's intended to be kind of a warm symbol of safety and security, hopefully, that people who are seeking our assistance are dropped. There are a number of training opportunities and topics that I know SPD could benefit from. Um, and this slide is just an example of some of those. So real quickly, the, the critical decision-making model on the left is one that's been adopted by agencies across the country, and it provides a roadmap for decisions we make on a daily basis as officers. Um, extremely important to me, and in the middle here, is the four tenets of procedural justice, and those are the key to building trust with the community that we serve. I think we engage in these ideals, but we need to establish them as a core of how we operate, and it's going to be critical as we evolve as an agency. And on the right side there, it's, it's a relatively new program called Active Bystander Training for Law Enforcement, but it's in direct alignment with the new House Bill 2929 that requires a duty to intervene uh, and report misconduct. And I, the way this was explained to me, and I think it was a great example, is we don't let our friends drive drunk. We see something bad is happening, we step in to prevent something worse from happening. We take their keys away, we give them a ride home. What this curriculum does is it equips our officers to just do that. When you see something is going down a road where you think it may, may not end appropriately, it allows us to identify the signs and gives us tools and tactics on how we can step in um, and prevent a bad thing from happening. <clears throat> we're, we're developing a peer support program. So officer wellness is one of the foundational pillars I described earlier. The trauma that officers encounter on a daily basis has a cumulative effect on physically and physiologically. And uh, the harsh reality of this work compounded with the long hours and the stress are something that I take extremely seriously. We have to take care of the members of this organization so that they can take care of us as a city. According to a recent Washington Post article, officer suicide kills more officers every year than gunfire and car accidents combined. I don't ever wanna have that happen here. And so what we're doing is we're developing ways to provide support. Uh, we recently held a course here at SPD um, for our members and some of our partner agencies on emotional survival for law enforcement to create awareness and strategies for how to stay healthy and recognize signs of stress. And we're currently investing in a robust peer support program that includes trained SPD members to provide a shoulder to lean on during tough times. And they're also trained on how to conduct critical incident debriefs related to traumatic incidents. And they can provide access to services that can save relationships, careers, and ultimately lives. <clears throat> so that concludes I went about five minutes longer than I wanted to, but that concludes my formal update on those four topics. Thanks again for allowing me the time tonight to share these updates. And I look forward to discussing or answering any questions you might have during the remainder of our time together. All right. I'm going to thank you, Chief. Um, I'm going to start with Leonard and then we'll work down the hands. Well, thanks a lot for the presentation, Chief. It's a lot of information to take in. Um, so the IA Pro software is what you're going to be using to store the records relevant to investigations that you conduct. Who will have access to this IA Pro software? That is, there's a number of people that can put data in from officers that fill out the modules and sergeants and lieutenants can put data in. But the person that has the ability to, to access all the data related to complaints and use of force is our professional standards sergeant. That's locked down. So they have, they're the one, the keeper of that information. And then hopefully when I can assign this analyst sometime in the near future, they will have access to that as well. Once a citizen files a complaint, would they have access to the pro, uh, to the pro software? 
they don't have which, access. They don't have access to get into the software. But what it does, it allows us as an agency to track the timelines when they filed the complaint, different steps along the way. So hopefully, it'll, it'll allow us to give better updates as to what's happening with the investigation. Would would they be able to? Would the citizen be able to get access to the information and the outcome of the investigation? Yes, we we would we'd be able to get them the outcome of that investigation. I mean, as far as all the the interviews and things like that, I don't know that we can release that because that's all personnel related <laughs> issues. But we would absolutely um, get them the final outcome. Okay. Um, the um, early on, there was a table um, that talked about the effectiveness of various uses of force. I'm thinking that there's probably there are probably different outcomes that you're looking for based on the different uses of force. Like, for instance, showing someone a taser would have a different desired outcome from actually using the taser. So can, can you just give us a general um, I, I, I guess a general overview of what the desired effectiveness is for uh, for each of them. Like a, a a the ideal percentage that we're looking for. Well, not not a percentage. I mean, where are they all? Are are, are all of the effectivenesses um, related to just discouraging the? Um, to, to discouraging the subject or? Um... I, I, th I think largely what, what that will do for us is let's say um, I, I deploy pepper spray on someone. If it doesn't work, when I fill out my police report, I'm going to write in there it didn't work. And so at the end of the year, we have all these different types of force that we have used and we can really evaluate which ones are most effective, which ones are not effective. If they're not effective, is it something we need to get rid of? Do we need to provide better training? Do we need a different type of equipment? It's just going to inform us on what our officers are using most often, A, and what's what's most effective and least effective. Okay. Um, the uh, the body-worn cameras are going to be syncing up with the cameras inside the, um, the car. It is, um, is the body-worn camera going to be able to sync with, their, with all of the cars, or are there ones that are going to need to be retrofitted? Um, I believe all of the car, the, the cars that we deploy on the street every day have, have the car cameras installed in them. So as an officer, I take my portable camera from the precinct when I leave, no matter what car I go log into, now, now I sync to that particular car that I'm in. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's more or less what I was looking for. I just didn't know if there were any cars that were not fitted with those cameras. Um, so are the uh, the the inside cameras the the, the cameras inside the um, car are they activated by the siren um, once it go once it's activated? Um, when you turn the lights on, it activates it activates all the cars. But one of the mandatory times when we have to have the recordings going is when we're transporting someone. So if there's okay. someone in our car, we have to turn the camera on. It doesn't just take the siren. So would the body worn camera be activated also by turning yeah. the lights on? Yeah, they're, they're all on? they're 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 all on. Okay, so it, I, it but but that's when it turns on. The body worn yeah. camera would be when yeah. when you're lighting someone up. When you light it up, that's an automatic trigger. Or okay. at any time I want to, I just push the button on it. That also okay. activates all of them as well. Got it. Okay. So um, this, uh, getting back to the IA Pro software for a second, is there going to be anything inside the software that identifies um, outliers among the officers that are being mentioned in these reports more often than others? Yeah, we will have the ability um, to look, pull use of force data at the end of the year. And if, if there is an outlier officer, we will know who that is, the types of force they're using, and, and, and a host of other information. Okay, um, the um, HB forty three oh one. I know that that was uh, that was covered in one of these recommendations. Uh, it was uh, it covers uh, a de escalation policy that's being implemented statewide. Is, is it going to be implemented here? Do you think? Yes. In fact, the language um, that we have in our use of force policy is it, it covers everything in that House bill already. So we are already we're already ahead of that. Okay, good. I, I just got one more. Um, the uh, uh, you were saying that the, uh, the the officer who is the subject of an investigation would not be able to put one of his fellow officers 
or her fellow officers on the use of force review board. Um, who is going to be on the use of force review board? Um, there's a number of people outlined in policy and I, I don't have the policy right in front of me, but there's a Lieutenant assigned to it. There's um, patrol tactics um, instructors attached to it. I believe there's a firearms instructor attached to it. Um, the involved member can pick somebody of their choosing to be on it. Um, I, I, I want to say there's about six people assigned to it, but I have to refer back to the policy to get the exact, the exact makeup of it. Is, is anyone so from there, there's, there's a CIT uh, that specifically requires a CIT trained uh, member of the department to be there also. Is anyone from outside the department going to be on the board? There, can you hear me? Um, no, I, I, I couldn't. I lost that. I'm sorry. Oh, no, there, there is not an outside member on the use of force review, review committee. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Marilee. I, I just have a few questions. Um, thank you for your presentation. It's very thorough. I, I appreciated it. Um, in, I know that the complexity of different situations has, will be involved with this, but is there any estimation on a time frame um, for a completion of an initial investigation or further investigations um, that, the, that a member of the public could have in regards to an incident? Is there... It, like I said, I, I understand it can vary according to the complexity of the incident, but is there is there a time frame beyond the end of a shift report? Are you talking about a, a complaint on an officer's behavior? Or are you talking about like a, a officer involved shooting or what type of incident are you referring to? The completion of an, in, an initial investigation report. There's a report at the end of the, there's a report done at the end of a shift. Oh, I but, got you. If you have a further investigation, is there a is there a, a is there a time slot frame or whatever as to how long an investigation hopefully will take? Um, if there is a if there is an internal affairs investigation that is that is initiated, that investigation um, has to be completed within thirty days. Okay. Unless there's an exception made by the chief of police for an articulable reason. Okay, I I, pre I figured it was probably somewhere else in the material that we didn't have, but I was curious as to what the answer to that. Um, okay, um, I was look I was considering the IA Pro as well, and is the IA Pro or is it somewhere else um, that would ease the access for the officer to to have the information pop up? that would have popped up for the mental health um, information that was given in, regard, in regards to Kenny. Yeah, um, that, that, is, is there any system that's available to have that come to the officer? That, yeah, I, that is not IAPRO. IAPRO is kind of a back-end software that collects data and processes it for later. That's the okay. type of information that would be maintained in our, in our CAD system, our dispatch system, the, car, the computers that are in the car. That is not, that is not related to IAPRO. Okay, so 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 you so an officer stops someone, and somebody has made a has filed a, a information, as the Kenny family did. Um, how how does the officer end up getting that information in a timely way? Um, that information, if we run somebody's you know name or license plate or some kind of identifying information, the officer can run that in the computer. And then at some point when that hit comes back to them, they can review that in the computer or um, our dispatchers often when an officer does a car stop and they need to get out of the car and make contact quickly and not just necessarily sit in the car waiting for the information to come back. So a lot of times our dispatch will be doing that, 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 that work in parallel and can then broadcast the information to them over the radio. Okay. Okay. So I think that's something that we need to be staying you know, on top of um, is having that information come, come forward. Um, let's see, is, I, I like the idea of re, of, uh, re, uh, getting the cadet program back up and running. I think that's a, a great resource. I'm a strong advocate for school resource officers as well. Um, I do believe that that creates a, um, less formal, more casual way of, 
uh, connecting with uh, with uh, various elements of our community, various parts of our community, um, and creating a relationship there that, in a way that doesn't necessarily involve somebody, you know, being stopped or or being in that kind of a situation. So I, I like I like both of those. Um, the um, I have one other question here. Um, what when you when a report goes in on the tasers and you you mentioned a manufacturer's analysis what is the manufacturer's analysis so they can tell the exact um length of time that the taser was deployed they can tell how many different activations there were how many times uh, somebody pulled the trigger they can tell if those activations were that they actually made a connection or not. They can tell if there was, you know, actually a, a, a result that the person being tased felt or not. Um, so there's, there's a lot of analysis that they can do that we just don't have the ability to do. I would think that that would be important. I know, I know, I know how trained our officers are, but it, when you're in the midst of a situation like that, you can lose track, I think sometimes. And I think that's a, that analysis is good to, is good to have come back. I can see that being a benefit. I think that was it. Um, yeah, that was that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Chief. Uh, it was a great presentation. I, I have some questions here that may offer uh, some clarity for me, and also maybe potentially for clarity for others to decipher it into lay terms in some areas. Um, so first, I wanted to say I'm a very strong advocate of the school resource officer program. I cannot say enough about it. And I think we need to make sure that we, we are continuing to do that or bolster it up or do whatever we can, but I don't want to see that go weakened at all. I'm a very strong uh, advocate for the, an explorer slash cadet program. Um, I, have, I was one back about 16 millennia ago. But I can tell you that I can remember some amazing times while I was an explorer and while I had friends of explorers who were became police officers later and are, are retired now. And I'm still friends with those same explorer scouts when we were 15, 16 years old. Um, but that was the most impactful program that I had as a youth. And I do know that, that we attracted a bunch of different folks from all, the entire economic spectrum uh, because back then I was very low in the economic spectrum, but it meant a lot to us. Everybody was equal. Everybody was treated the same and everybody got the same material. So we were all one group and it didn't matter what color of skin we had or what economic socioeconomic scale we were. So I cannot say enough for that. I've been saying this for probably, well, go ahead, Chantel. How many times have I mentioned this Explorer program and how important it is and how far we've gotten? So about six years. Yeah. So anyway. That's important. So go back and, and in regards to uses of force, I think Leonard was talking about, I think what it boils down to is the type of force that's deployed is, is that the goal of that is to get compliance. And it's not, it's, it's the amount of compliance you gain from those, those tools or the, the method used, whether it's focus blows or taser or baton, um, any electronic stun device, those things are, what you're trying to do ultimately is, is only gain compliance and, and you don't need to go beyond that. So that's that's the goal it's in simple terms. Um, so on re under recommendation six, Chief, you uh, I think what you're talking about as far as in regards to uh, making statements during an investigation that could be criminal or is criminal right up front, and then potentially going into an eternal. So I think that's, and I may be wrong, but, but that's you're talking about what they call a Garrity issue. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. So the Garrity issue is case law, so that way you don't run into some double jeopardy issues. So that's something that protects those staff from those double jeopardy issues. And it's well, well, in case, well founded and rooted case law that the office or well, police agencies cannot delve into. So they have to separate deaths and internal investigations have to wait until there's, there's no criminal investigation. So that's, that causes it in itself can cause a ton of time when they hand off a case to another agency because they can't do their own criminal investigation is handed off. Well, that's on the other agency's timeline. So it could be a long time or a very short time, depending upon the caseload of the other agencies. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So then number 12, 
I was talking about as far as um, during tasers, deployment of tasers. And I think you referred to those, there's uh, little paper tags that fly out with the uh, taser deployment. They're called RFIDs. And those RFIDs, um, or I'm sorry, AFIDs. Um, those AFIDs, little tags do tell that, but uh, and, and tell everything exactly what the chief said. But I'm curious, and I, what I hasn't, I haven't heard, and maybe I just assumed our tasers. There's two different, two different models. Some that have video, and other ones are not video capable. So, do our tasers are they video capable? So that way, those videos start the moment it's triggered. No, we don't have video capable tasers. Have we looked at that? Because I tell you what, I've seen a lot in that area and I think it's a wise investment. Okay, um, I, I don't know if the department has researched that. That's not something I'm familiar with, but I can definitely look into that. I would highly recommend that because you know, as well as I know, that with officer worn cameras that your body can be one way and your arm outstretched a different direction and your body worn camera is not gonna catch any of that deployment. And it's not gonna catch what happens to that person the moment it, it activates. Um, with those electronic jewels. So uh, those videos that are on those those tasers, I don't even know if they even make them still, but I, I think they were invaluable when I previewed those. You get to see everything right literally from where right the moment it's 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 triggered or deployed. Okay, we will uh, we'll absolutely look into that and see check the feasibility of that. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it's just something to cross off a list if it's not possible, I suppose. Uh, item number 30, where it's regarding, um, or let's say it's uh, back to the tasers. When you said in policy, it bothered me a little bit, when you said in policy that um, you're not permitting or, or simultaneous deployment is not permitted. And it, it, I get it, and it, but it does spook me a little bit because I think everybody should be aware that you don't know what the person at oblique angle to you, or you may not even see, is deploying at the same time. So to prohibit that, you're automatically putting in, putting them afoul of, of a policy that they could potentially be subjected to disciplinary action when in, when in fact, they're only reacting to what they're seeing at the time. It happens in regular shootings with deadly force, but, but tasers just as well. So um, I'm concerned about maybe how, just maybe how it's written, to, to keep that into mind in mind so that way the officers aren't jammed up right away by running a foul of a policy and find themselves defending themselves in regards to the simultaneous deployment. Um, on number 33, you said a statement. Um, you said that, that uh, that's in regards to letting the family know um, on a deadly shooting situation, uh, the, the victim of that deadly force incident is that the department will put out a statement in regards to that as soon as it's possible, which makes sense. And then you, you follow it up with, and, and we will send some people out to talk with the family. But the, uh, but the Kenny report, you know, threw you under the bus and said, the chief should go out and make that statement to the family. And I'm just making sure that based on what you're talking about in this proposal, if there is something different than that recommendation, um, and I and I, it makes sense to me to have you know actually more than one person go, multiple people go from the department to you know because some people are going to key in on some and and some may not see eye to eye. You know, it's it's best to have a couple, two or three people there so that way we don't have a uh, some personality instant personality conflicts and also for protection for litig potential litigation down the road or complaints, but. Um, just want to make sure that the public is aware that it's not necessarily the most appropriate use to have the actual chief go to say it, and it may, but we also should not put ourselves in a corner in regards to requiring a chief to be present. So that was, I was just worried about the wording behind that. Um, hey, Joe, could you go back for a second, right? Yep. You're just commenting about the chief in general as a, as a position, right? Not necessarily something from, from Chief Shear. No, no, it was, it was, it was actually in the, the report that called out the chief. Right. But, and then the it, chief, and the chief said that he agreed, but then said it was going to be staff. So okay. I just want to make sure that people were, oh, go ahead, chief. I, yeah. Um, yeah. Just to follow up on that. I, I frankly think if there's an officer involved shooting, especially when the results in a death, it should be the chief of police. 
Now that's a very emotional situation. Um, I'm not saying that we're gonna, the chief is gonna be at the house 20 minutes later to make the announcement to the family, but at some point the chief needs to make themselves available to that family. And there may be a family that doesn't wanna to talk to the chief of police and that's okay. But I think we need to strive to, to make ourselves available. There, we may or may not be able to share very much information depending on the status of the investigation and how soon after this event happened. But I think the chief of police should be the person that goes out and, and shares that time with the family because it, it's, a, it's a traumatic incident for them. And it, was, it would be this agency that was uh, involved in that. So that, that's how I see that. Yeah, and I concur with that, Chief. I just want to make sure that the public who's listening to this is aware that that option, you know, you can ex exercise that option, whatnot, but also it may be uh, wise to have some other folks there with sure. you for sure. And I assume you would do that, but it just have to be um, incident dependent. Um, I I'm glad you brought that out and, and I agree with you. Um, moving on to IA Pro, IA Pro um, when you have a, uh, the review part, the it showed the um, schematic of the process of, where that report goes and who's in the reviewing process. You talked about the professional standards sergeant and or a supervisor, depending upon the type of, of allegation, I assume. So I just wanted to, what you didn't mention, I'm making an assumption, or is that a correct assumption? If it's it's going to be, it won't be the supervisor of the, of the defendant officer. Or would it? Or could so, it? so, so, it, it's for example, it's two o'clock in the morning. Somebody comes into the front desk here at the at the office, and they want to complain about you know a traffic stop or something that happened. A sergeant's going to come. They're going to take their initial information. They're going to take that complaint. But then what they're going to do, rather than just investigate that all the way through, that's going to get entered into IA Pro, and it's going to go to professional standards. So now professional standards knows there was a complaint about Officer X. We're going to evaluate um, that complaint and make a determination. Is it a low level so we can assign that to a sergeant to do the follow up or is it a little more involved or maybe it needs to go to professional standards, internal affairs, do that investigation. But the reality is, is that that is now going to be tracked all through the system and professional standards knows all the complaints that are coming in, who's investigating them and maintaining the timelines to make sure we get them done in a timely fashion. That makes sense. Is that what you're asking? Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and, and just the accountability factor is that the professional standards sergeant will also know who is, if it wasn't him, who exactly, um, him or her, who exactly was assigned for reviewing it and tracking their progress on that review to make sure or keep their finger on it to make sure that it doesn't go sideways. Yes, correct. Perfect. I like that. And and uh, uh, second to the last year, under the ABLE program, you indicated that, and and Maybe I heard it wrong, but you said uh, it's the ability for the citizens to intervene. I think you meant for the officers or colleagues to intervene. Right. If I said, yeah, if I said community members, it's, this is specific for officers to intervene with other officers. Because I definitely didn't want that message to get out to have citizens jump on in and, and help with their perception that there may be something a foul that citizens are not allowed to do that unless specifically requested to by an officer. And even then it becomes voluntary. Okay, cool. And then um, under the peer support program, I, I love it. It looks like it's starting to get ro robust and using other agencies, uh, teams, uh, cr critical incident teams to pull them in out of, you know, because it's safer quite often to not have a coworker talk about things that are very sensitive to an officer at that time. Uh, and some officers will never talk to coworkers or colleagues, um, but you didn't mention if you've made contact or have started your clergy program to see if there is, if you made progress in developing a clergy contact for those officers. Uh, I met with our, with our peer support team just last week, and I made it very clear to them that when they're building this program, that uh, the clerg having clergy members assigned to part of our peer support team is extremely important, and it's a tremendous resource, I think, that exists in the community. Um, so that's something we're absolutely pursuing. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm sorry for taking up so much time, but I got a lot of questions. <laughs> but thank you. You're welcome. Corey? Thank you. Uh, I also very much appreciate the thoroughness of the report um, and appreciated going through all of the items that were in the Kenny settlement and sort of hearing where things are on that. And I appreciate that you've dug into making the policy changes and you touched on this a little bit, and this is really more of a, a 
comment slash question. Um, now that you've done the policy work, it sounds like you're looking to hire someone, I think you said, who was focused on strategic and comprehensive training plan, because that's where a lot of my kind of focus and concerns are, is how is the training now going to come in and enforce and reinforce the policies and how you're going to, this is where it's sort of a statement question, um, if you've already started to kind of identify the, the training priorities and whether or not we're going to like be looking to, to train around, um, you know, those policy shifts and changes to make sure particularly some of our, our longer employed officers understand the changes and shifts. Um, and whether or not we're also going to be bolstering in that training with, I know I've, I've sort of beat this drum before around implicit bias and, and if we're going to be working to hire diverse officers to make sure that we're building the training and the expectations into the department to support that. Sort of sounded like a question within 12 questions. Um, yes, training is probably one of the most important things a police agency can do. If you want to evolve a culture, if you want to properly equip and your, your members to be effective when they go out and do the job that we ask them to do, you have to provide them high quality training. So the, the challenge is for any police department, um, there's a limited number of people and there's a limited number of hours during the week. There's a mandatory, there's mandatory trainings that the state requires every year. It might be control tactics. It might be on legislative updates. It might be on first aid. So there's certain required trainings that we have to do. And then it's about identifying the additional trainings above and beyond that, that we want to do as an, as an organization. Um, the person, the sergeant that I want to assign to the professional standards division, while they're also assisting the, the professional standards lieutenant with investigations, I think as a command staff, we can identify the training priorities for the year. And then, but now we have somebody that can that come up with a roadmap, a six month or 12 month roadmap on how to best get that training out to our organization. I mean, every time we change a policy, we should be training the officers what that change is all about. We can have them read it, we can have them sign it, but we should be covering that in a training. And then there's these changes to use of force policies. And so there's been long ingrained um, um, norms on how we apply different uses of force. We change a policy related to that. We have to provide the training to people if we expect them to meet the new policy. So that, that is a, a high priority for me is establishing that roadmap as we move forward in the year ahead. And it's going to take somebody to really own that. And we can come up with all the ideas in the world, but there's a lot of work behind the scenes to actually implement it and schedule it and make it happen and build the lesson plans, et cetera. Thank you. That was really my only question was just to highlight that, the importance of that. So thank you. Damian. Uh, Hey, Chief, thanks for the report. A um, couple of, well, one thing for, first, I mean, I have a couple of things. Uh, the one, one thing that I would really like to see is a diversity statement by you that really sets the tone on how the department is going to move forward of increasing diversity and inclusion, making it a focal point, and also some type of action plan. I mean, I, you know, we all know that a lot of people love to say throw the word around and pat themselves in the back for having a, a, a definition. But, you know, I would like to see a statement that prompts action, uh, if possible. Um, another thing that I wonder is, and I understand based on population, but you mentioned increasing uh, Latinx you know, police officers, and, and I'm curious why just that group uh versus other racial minorities or even though you have a higher rate of uh, women in the police force that doesn't negate uh bad treatment and so i'm curious how that's going to move forward uh back to the the latinx piece I, I think you know the way that the state of oregon seems to operate is you know add brown and stir meaning that you bring in some minorities <laughs> and everything's good which uh, one, it, it negates uh, the biases among various, you know, racial minorities saying, oh, we hire some black people. That means that we're good on hiring people who identify as Asian, which I, I, I've never agreed with. Uh, but then also you bring those people in. How are you going to retain them? Uh, 
Yeah. And, and so th that's that piece. Why just one demographic versus others? And how are you going to uh, retain? And uh, how are you going to focus on the retention piece before you focus on the recruitment piece? Uh, three. So I, from my experience, I, I, I grew up with a, a school resource officer, but my high school was all black and that person was black. And so that dynamic was completely different. However, my fear of having a school resource officer in any of the Springfield schools is that they're going to target people who look like me or teachers are not gonna be able to handle certain uh, race or gender incidents and so the perpetrator is always going to be seen as a person who looks like me. And, and so I'm just curious how, and this kind of ties into Council Raleigh's, you know, what type of training, what type of standards are you going to set forth for not only these officers, but especially the, the school resource officers? Because I think you have a great opportunity to support and educate K through 12 to where we can end up changing the whole culture. And so this is a very, very important position, but I fear the reality of people who look like me being the ones who are sent to the police or who the police are going to see as perpetrators more so than any other group. Okay, I'm done, thanks. <laughs> All right, so I got, I got essentially three, three, different, three different questions there, I think. So as far as a statement, uh, an action plan, something that prompts that prompt uh, a statement that prompts action within the PD. I agree with you. I think we do need some kind of a statement that's meaningful and not just window dressing for the department. So uh, that's important. I'm committed to that, and I will absolutely be talking further about doing that. Um, as far as the focus, when you said why just fo focusing on the Latinx, the only and I'm not just focusing on the Latinx, but what I was showing is the demographics of the city. The demographics of the PD. I don't know that there's any any real studies that have been done to show that just mirroring the exact demographics of the city and your police department is the key. That's just that's just the 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 comparison that I was showing there. And I think what it showed is the area where we're most disparate right now um, is in that particular community. That doesn't mean we're not going to continue to recruit and try to create an environment that's welcoming to everybody from all those groups. That was just to demonstrate that that is the, the biggest gap when you compare it to the demographics of the city. Um, when it comes to the diversity, equity, and inclusion, I, I agree with you 100%. It's not just about selecting people that look a certain way to check a box and match whatever. You have to create an environment internally that's inclusive because diversity in and of itself accomplishes really nothing. You have to create an environment that's inclusive so the diverse people that you bring into an agency want to be there, they feel included, they feel like they have a voice and they've got, a, um, you're doing everything you can to make sure everybody has e uh, equal opportunity for success. So it's not just about the diversity, it's about creating that inclusive environment internally. Um, and as far as the SROs, um, I will have to get back to you on specific training that our SROs have. I just, I'm just not aware of what, what, what they've had in front of them. And I don't have any of the data related to how many contacts that they make each year, how many of those contacts result in some kind of a, an arrest versus some kind of a diversion to some, some other kind of service or something like that. So I'm sure there's a lot of data. I hope there's a lot of data out there that exists that kind of paint a picture for us of how they do business on a daily basis, but that's something I'm going to have to get back to you. All right, Steve. That too, pretty, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, the result report uh, made some recommendations. Are, are those folded into this docu document that you produced? Uh, that's my question. And then the other one, there's, there's a word called transparency, which is all over out there, which I've never used, but I do understand what it means. And there's certain committees, groups within this report that are internal within the force. And, and, and the public looks at those thinking that uh, they're just making good decisions for, for the police department. How can, how can we do some, something there that makes people comfortable that, that uh, it, it's legitimate, legal, and uh, fair for everybody? 
and uh, the enforce the enforce review board was was an example of that. It's all internal people, and uh, how can we let people outside know that everything's done fair? That's all. Thank you. Um, I, th I think the written. The written recommendation you're talking about, I know we include in the packet, we just listed out the recommendations, but not the responses. We have crafted a, a document that has written responses to each of these recommendations. And we intend at some point to put it on our website and release it publicly. But I don't want to do that until we've had this meeting with the representatives of the Kenny family. We've shared that with them. We've gone back and forth a little bit. They have some recommendations that would, they would like us to change. And so we want to sit at the table and have some discussion about that before we release the final, the final version to the public. Yeah, I want to make sure some of that's considered in what we do. That's important. Absolutely. Okay, and and I'm and I got a couple of questions here, and then we'll get wrapped up for CETA. Um, yeah, I'm supportive of of making making the entire the entire responses public. Um, you know, if the written responses, and when I read the entire pack, and I would just encourage you to sort of break up all the different sort of reports and just get a little clearer about where it's coming from, where you're actually at, make it, maybe you make it a red light, green light report. But like, you know, when you read, when you read the recommendations and just text form, it's a little bit hard to follow. Um, and just be open to the fact when we, when we give it to the public, some simplification about what's going on could, could help. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things I saw in the recommendation is there's some stuff in there that is specific to Hey, we should advocate for a change in policy for it fit, but we don't control that, correct? Like correct. Because the DA has sole discretion over that. Correct. Is there a way? Or well, I think two questions I have is that is the DA still is is their office still supportive of making these changes? I believe so. I, they met okay. with. Um... They, they met with the OIR group and the, the OIR group did a follow-up report specific to ITFIT. Um, I know they have a work group specifically to address the recommendations um, to them that, that is still ongoing, but I don't know what the results of that are. At this point. So I think my second question is, is there a way that we as a collective council can sort of advocate with the elected leaders in the DA's office to just be more open? Do you need any more support than what you're getting right now? Um, that is um, potentially something that we would ask and be and ask for your help in that. But I think I would I would talk to the district attorney first myself and just get an update on the status of all that before I would come back and, and ask for that kind of input. Yeah. And I think I think people around here are uh, supportive of, you know, like I know you guys are working on the technical piece of it, but Right, from a policy perspective, right, getting these two kind of parts of the conversation aligned and, you know, continuing to look for a better way to do uh, to, to deal with that process is going to become important. Um, I did have a couple of questions specific to um, specific to the complaint forms. Um, so one of the things that, that in, the, in the slideshow it describes is that you, you come in, you find a sergeant, the sergeant takes the complaint form. Is the sergeant required to take your complaint? I would say yes. I mean, if somebody wants to complain, if somebody comes in and wants to complain about something that is a potential policy violation or a violation of law, then yes, they have to take that complaint. We have to look into it. So one of the, and again, I don't have any specifics, but one of the kind of ad hoc questions that I always get about our current complaint process, and it may not be, um, true going to the new software is that sometimes it's a little bit like you have to sort of convince people to take it. And I don't know if that's sort of people's experiences or if it's set sort of forward in policy, but you're, you're saying that regardless of that, if somebody walks in and wants to complain, you know, file a complaint, we're taking their complaint. Yeah, we're going to take that complaint. We're going to enter their name into the computer and the date and the time and the allegation, and then we'll make a determination how to move forward with it. But what IA Pro does is allow us to we can track all of those complaints now where I think in the past, some of those might not have been documented. And is there a second intake point or do I have to always come down for and find a sergeant, right? Like if I'm, for some reason, if I don't wanna walk into the front of the police department and find a sergeant, where's the other place that I can go in to put a complaint in? Well, if you wanted to call in and just say, I want to talk to someone, make a complaint, I'm not, I'm not comfortable walking into the front of the police department, you can call in and make a complaint as well. I mean, I think 
I would recommend someone if they just don't want to talk to anyone at the PD, they could probably reach out to the city hall and say they want to make a complaint. But ultimately, we're going to have to reach out to the person so we can begin to get the information and initiate an investigation. We can't do it without talking to somebody at some point. But we could we could find an alternative if right like to start that process. If somebody doesn't want to walk in the front door of, of city hall to file a complaint, right? There's other ways to sort of figure it out to get the information. Sure. Okay. Um, the only other, I guess, general comment listening listening to the entire review, there is a lot in here of updated policy, updated training, updated, you know, new, and we were not hope, like it's going to take a while before some of this sort of gets flushed out and we get a we you guys sort of execute it the first time. Um, so I guess do you have any any sense of it's one thing to rewrite it in policy. It's the second thing to sort of double check to make sure that it's actually happening or do that sort of work on the ground to really train and ingrain this into into your culture at the PD. Uh, do you have a sense for how you're going about that second challenge? Because I think you've hit the first one, which is, hey, update, update the policies and procedures. The second one is, can we execute it every single day? I think it's about accountability up the chain of command. Because when an officer is engaged in a particular incident, and they write a report about that incident. It is what is the level of accountability as that documentation goes up the chain of command and potentially all the way to the chief of police. Are there other people putting eyes and reading that police report? Are there other people that are watching that body camera footage to make sure that everything is in the police report that's supposed to be in there to make sure that everybody did the right thing all along the way? And maybe there's some inadvertent mistakes. Maybe somebody forgot to add something to the police report that should be in there by policy, well, a sergeant needs to identify that and say, hey, you forgot to talk about your de-escalation stuff in here. That's required. Um, or potentially they identify discrepancies or as they're reviewing other people's police reports, maybe there's something that rises to the level that, that demands some kind of an internal investigation or misconduct. The only way we can identify these things, know if we're being successful or for finding problems is through increased accountability and review as these, these incidents are, are looked at as they move up the chain of command to get multiple sets of eyes on them. Yeah, yeah, and it might, and with new technology and new reporting, right, like it's gonna take, like it's gonna take some of that, you know, people seeing defects and going, hey, try it again, is people mm -hmm. learn the new process and procedures. And I just wanna acknowledge that I'm open to, like as you guys go down this road, that it's going to take a little bit of rehandling, rework, you know, looking at it again to be able to get it right. And as long as we're continuing just to set the bar about where we want to be, right? Like it's there's nothing wrong with having high expectations. I appreciate that. Steve? Uh, my question on transparency wasn't answered. And, and all I'm trying to say is decisions by the Enforce Review Board how can they be made comfortable to the public? And, and the, I forget how to pronounce this, IDFIT meetings also. Uh, how can the public be sure that those are done properly? Well, I think when we have a use of force review board, make an evaluation and determination if this force followed policy yeah. um, and the tools were used appropriately, we're going to have to be transparent in producing something that lets the public know that yes, we reviewed it and here's what we found. Uh, we'll have to work with the city attorney to determine exactly what we can share publicly and can't, right. but, but we are gonna need to be transparent and share how we got to the conclusion we did and what the potential outcomes are. And, and what I'm referring to is it's an internal group and the, some of the public is, is suspicious of that outcome. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's all I'm trying to refer to. I appreciate that. Leonard? I, uh, real quick, uh, Chief, I hope that at some point there will be some thought given to a return to the use of force continuum that was abandoned by more or less all of the departments back in the 80s. Uh, I know that the intent was to give the officers more discretion and flexibility in accelerating or decelerating uh, the use of force, but I think um, it's almost uniformly used um, when we moved away from it. It's been used to accelerate force and you always have the ability to decelerate if you wanted. I'm just hoping that it'll be considered. Thanks. Joe. And you're on mute. 
All right. You'd think I'd learn. Don't shake your head, Damien. Okay, so I got a comment on the use of force continuum, and it, it wasn't the police agencies removing it. The police agencies, it was one of the best things, best tools on the planet to teach defensive tactics and 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 skills. And it was taken away because of some case law and and an extreme amount of lawsuits because of the interpretation of that use of force continuum, because it was specified, it seemed to apply that there was stair step to, to force and negate the, the negate the use of force by being able to go when sometimes you have to go from from standing there in uniform to a deadly force situation and you're not going to pull out your baton you it, it it seems to imply that you have to go through those different steps before you can use deadly force when in fact at the time you're dead because of it so it wasn't it wasn't like an attempt to reduce the the incidences of force and it was it was because it was it didn't it didn't allow for having to do those split second decisions. Please chime in, Chief, if I'm wrong, or even if I'm not wrong, but feel free to chime in to allow some sort of other explanation. But it's it's the use of force was was something that that most agencies I know as defensive tactics instructors it was a great tool to, to be able to help teach new officers but those were those are stripped away and it's mostly because of the state did it through dpsst it wasn't even an agency's call well my my understanding was that the officers had discretion to de-escalate or to or not to escalate the use of force all along and that it was just really in order to give them more discretion was the intent i um I, I, I'd, I'd love to have the chief's input on that. Yeah, I think, I mean, what we've gone to is a, what's called the Graham standard and it's objectively reasonable. What is objectively reasonable based on the totality of the circumstances? Those are the totality of the circumstances that you're facing right in front of you, the training, the experience, the number of officers, the time of day. What is the totality of the circumstances that allow me to do what, it, what I did? I think the use of force continuum was very, it was less ambiguous because it basically painted a, if A, then B, if B, then C. And it was very easy to kind of visualize and follow. If they have a knife, then I have a gun. If they have their hands, I have my pepper spray. Um, but the, 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 basically the courts, I think, have dictated across the country that we're going to go to an objective, what's objectively reasonable standard um, across the country. That makes sense. Yeah, and I don't know that we've got to settle this for everybody, you know, tonight. So um, really, I really appreciate the conversation for uh, from everybody. The next time we're going to probably have pol police in some sort of work session, probably in the first quarter, sometimes sometime we'll do the annual uh, use of force report and probably have the joint uh, joint hearing with SPAC um, as soon as we can get it scheduled. Um, unless anybody's got any questions, we are supposed to be in CETA, and I hear the CETA chair is fired up to make sure that we're on time for everything. Um, AJ, we're on a different link, correct? That is correct. Then I will see you in the next meeting room, everybody. Thank you so much. We are adjourned. Okay.